everyone. My name is Ayahu Jiwara. I'm the director of Prince Takamado Japan Center for Teaching and Research Faculty of Arts at University of Alberta. This is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. 6 and 9th August are the anniversaries of dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. While we are facing very serious pandemic right now, we also want to take this opportunity to think about peace and non-proliferation by launching a collective book between Canadian and Japanese scholars, Hiroshima 75 Nuclear Issues in Global Context, published in 2020. Five years ago, international scholars gathered at the University of Alberta to discuss the how human beings lived with the atom for 70 years. This book's starting point is the dropping of the atomic bombs in 1945, but ex then expands the discussion to Cold War politics and popular culture, taking different examples from the author's expertise. Some contributors to the volume join us and talk about their chapters, starting with Dr. Ritsuko Komaki, she was born outside of Osaka, Japan in 1943. While she managed to escape the bomb because her parents moved out of Hiroshima during that time, her relatives and friends who remained in Hiroshima suffered from side effects of radiation for many years. After she moved to Hiroshima at the age of four, her association with radiation has defined her life. As an oncologist, she knows the negative and positive uses of the atom. Here is her message. Hi, uh, I'm very grateful to be included in this uh, book, Hiroshima 75. I'm Ritsuko Komaki. Uh, I'm a professor of the Bella College of Medicine, uh, emeritus professor at the MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, for 31 years. Uh, and uh, I was born in Amagasaki City. And uh, uh, I was raised in Hiroshima. And uh, uh, when an uh, atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, I was at Amagasaki City because my father was working in Osaka. My father uh, went into Hiroshima and uh, he was exposed to high dose uh, radiation uh, in the uh, black rain. We moved back to Hiroshima where my parents came from when I was four years old and uh, I was raised in Hiroshima. Uh, when we moved back to Hiroshima, uh, there were no houses and uh, no food. Uh, it was miserable life for many years. However, uh, my parents gave me education. I went to uh, elementary school, that's the place I met with Sadako Sasaki, and uh, she was just a peripheral area of Hiroshima city when the atomic bomb was dropped. And uh, she survived, but she developed uh, acute myelogenous leukemia when she was at age of 10 year old, and uh, she was admitted to Red Cross Hospital, and uh, she uh, tried to recover from her disease uh, by folding uh, origami bird Senbazuru 1000 cranes. However, she could make only 440, which have been displayed in the Atomic Bomb Museum in Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. And uh, 
when I went to junior high school where she registered, but uh, she could not attend. Uh, myself and uh, her older brother, as well as uh, some of her classmates, we got together and uh, I was uh, president of the students at that time at the junior high school and uh, we did the fundraising. Uh, we stood on the street of Hiroshima and also we wrote the letters to uh, deans of the all schools in Japan and also we made documentary movie 1000 Cranes which uh, was displayed all over uh, Japan and within two years uh, we got the funding to create the statue of atomic bomb children uh, which has been standing at the Peace Memorial Park since 1958. Uh, after I graduated from uh, Hiroshima University Medical School, uh, there was uh, protesting uh, f by the uh, medical student to request the Japanese government to improve the medical school uh, education system and uh, we went on strike and uh, we had to get out from uh, university hospitals that was not only Hiroshima University Hospital but all over Japan and uh, I came to United States uh, because of the uh, uh, connection of the chairman of the radiology at the ABCC Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission uh, at that time uh, and uh, now they call it Radiation Effect Research Foundation, RERF. And uh, I came to United States to study uh, uh, externship and a general internship and a fellow at the VA hospital uh, to do hematology oncology and then uh, I decided to be a radiation oncology resident at the Medical College of Wisconsin in 1974 and uh, I finished my residency program in 1978 and uh, I went to uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center as a fellow and also I did a fellowship at the Medical College of Wisconsin in 1979. And uh, I got married with Dr. James D. Cox uh, in 1979. Uh, I went to uh, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City uh, in 1985 and I came to MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, in uh, 1988 um, and when we came to MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, I started to be uh, section chief of the thoracic radiation oncology to treat uh, mainly lung cancer patients and with my husband uh, we decided to create the proton center uh, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, which opened uh, 2006. Uh, this was my dream to reduce any low dose of exposure all over the body to pediatric patients so they do not develop second malignancy or leukemia afterwards. And uh, we have treated uh, more than 12,000 patients successfully at the uh, Proton Center, MD Anderson Cancer Center. My husband was a vice president of patient care physician in chief at the MD Anderson and then he became chairman of the radiation oncology and uh, uh, head of the division of the radiation oncology uh, and uh, he was uh, editor in chief of the International Journal of Radiation Oncology physics and the biology 
uh, as well as uh, he was a chair of the radiation therapy oncology group, uh, RTOG. Uh, he was an uh, incredible uh, educator of the uh, radiation oncologist and the resident, and uh, also he was a great husband and a father, and uh, he passed away on August 14th, 2018, and uh, we all miss him so much. Uh, today is Father's Day, and uh, I would like to mention about his name. I wish uh, I can go back to Hiroshima on August 6th this year to pray for those people who passed away due to atomic bomb uh, and also the people who survived and developed uh, uh, malignancy and uh, all the relatives and uh, friends. And uh, I would like to pray peace on earth. Uh, I am very concerned about what is going on in the world uh, based on races uh, and the religion and the politics. And uh, I hope uh, atomic bomb would not be dropped any other place uh, in the world. Uh, thank you for your attention. My name is William Beard. Uh, I'm here to uh, talk to you for a couple of minutes about the essay that I provided for this anthology entitled uh, Nuclear Noir, Kiss Me Deadly, and uh, Nuclear Anxiety in Post-War America. An essay uh, which looks at the effect of the arrival of atomic weapons with their uh, appalling destructive capacity on the imagination of American culture, uh, both uh, literal and, and kind of subconscious. The film that I've chosen to exemplify this is a film noir called Kiss Me Deadly, uh, one of the very last noirs and one of the best fil uh, noir films uh, of the classic period. Uh, from 1955, uh, based on a, a Mickey Spillane uh, private eye uh, novel uh, of the same title, uh, featuring Mike Hammer, but making serious changes to the, the storyline there. In this film, there's a private detective who's chasing something that everybody else is chasing, assumed to be money or drugs or something like that. But in fact, what it turns out to be is something like a nuclear suitcase bomb. Uh, a thing, the discovery of which appalls uh, the, the detective and appalls everybody else around them as well. Uh, it is contained in a black box, uh, which when you crack it open, there's this horrible flood of noise and searing white light that comes out. Uh, and if it's open completely, as it is at the end of the film, it destroys, there's a kind of nuclear holocaust at the end of the film. Uh, a, a local one, I guess you could say, but it, it has... Um, I would say, uh, allegorical uh, qualities to it. What happens uh, in this film, uh, and by extension, uh, as the film is saying about American culture in general, is the destruction of classical values, uh, narrative values, in genre, in, in, in mainstream American cinema, which reflects mainstream American culture in general, mainstream, mainstream American social values. Uh, which where, where all the, the categories have now been shattered. And instead of a, uh, a kind of a, 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 narrate, a narrative field of, of depth and complexity, we have here instead a kind of blasted desert uh, where, where I'm, I'm speaking now uh, uh, metaphorically, uh, is it's amoral. There's, there's no kind of moral standard left anymore. Uh, there, the, everything has become flat and cold and materialized uh, in the film. And uh, so that the, the place where the bomb actually explodes at the end of this film uh, is in an environment which, in a sense, is already the one that has been created by the knowledge of the bomb, which is one that's, that is uh, radically uh, impoverished and radically uh, made meaningless. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you again here. I'm Mayako Shimamoto from Osaka University. 
and uh, I'm so glad that our books has been published finally. My article is about the nuclear problem between the United States and Japan during the early Cold War. Why did Japan start to buy uranium from the States and construct it as many as 53 nuclear plants? Because United States urged Japan to buy extra uranium to reduce expensive military budget and also to compete with Soviet policy of nuclear peaceful usage. As a result, Japan continued to buy uranium relying too much on nuclear energy until after the Fukushima disaster. Currently, with only three nuclear plants working and the rest of them stay offline, now Japan becomes a nation to rely on instead of nuclear energy, but uh, gas and oil, which deteriorate by environment with carbon dioxide. This is a nuclear dilemma, a serious environmental problem, which we have to find a way to resolve as early as possible. Here in this book, Dr. Ritsuko Komaki's story about her career is very much moving because she turned this dilemma to a beneficial nuclear usage by using radiation for treating cancer. Oh, I have one message to I.I. and David. Last May, I had a golden opportunity to meet Honorable Hisako Takamado. She's the wife of late Prince Takamado at Finnish Embassy in Tokyo, where a ceremony was held to commemorate 100th anniversary for Finnish-Japanese relations. She was a guest speaker to celebrate this happy occasion. To commemorate this, two books were published simultaneously. One is this one. Finnish version and the other is Japanese version with the same cover. And uh, also over there I was introduced to her as one of the contributors of this book she said she's so happy to hear that Hiroshima 75 would be published from Alberta University. And um, she said she was very happy to read it when it came out. Would you send it to her too? Thank you and bye bye. Hello, I'm Jim Keeley, now retired, but formerly with political science and strategic studies at the University of Calgary. I wrote the chapter on early British thinking about atomic energy control. When we think about this, we naturally think of the US and the Soviet Union in the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. I thought it would be interesting to look at the British approach to the problem in the months before the opening of that commission in June 1946. Toward the end of the war, a number of individuals and groups in governments and out were thinking about the question. In May, June 1945, Sir Ronald Campbell produced an initial report for British policymakers. In August 1945, the new Attlee government created the Advisory Committee on Atomic Energy under Sir John Anderson. That committee collected submissions and in early October produced its own report on the matter. Later that month, the committee under Sir Edward Bridges, the cabinet secretary, produced another report. 
Not none of these reports was particularly hopeful about the various control approaches they surveyed. Attlee himself rejected the Bridges report, but was hard pressed to come up with a more positive and stronger solution. Individuals in the US government had been concerned about the question, and there had been some contact with British officials, but the US focus after the war was on domestic questions and the international issue never really quite came together for them. There was no strong post-war contact with Britain on the matter until a meeting in Washington in November 1945 between British, American, and Canadian politicians. This produced the Washington Declaration. Yet it was an American, Vannevar Bush, a leader of the Manhattan Project, who had thought about the matter, who was invited by US officials at the last moment to outline an approach which became the basis for the Declaration. This points to a basic theme of the chapter. Britain, now a junior partner, had to act within parameters set by the United States. In 1946, Anderson's committee drew up draft instructions for the British delegation to the UNAEC without knowing what the US was thinking. Those instructions were overtaken in March by the release of the atchison Liliento report. And in any event, the British cabinet never approved the instructions. Once the American report and the later Baruch plan were produced, Britain had to operate within their limits, even though it found aspects of each suspect. In her history of the British atomic program, Margaret Gowing notes that the UK did not put forward its own proposals, but states that it was a reluctant and doubtful supporter of the American plan. Looking at the British reports and related documents, we can appreciate both the difficulties facing the control project and the reasoning behind Gowing's conclusion. Thank you. I'm Jin Hamamura, the author of the chapter Nuclear Proliferation and Double Standards. My chapter deals with the problem of double standards regarding the nuclear non-proliferation regime. The 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is widely regarded as a cornerstone of the global nuclear order. However, the treaty is highly unequal in legalizing a hierarchy between the five privileged nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states, which are the majority. The institutionalized hierarchy engenders a sense of injustice and frustrations and often flares up tensions over the alleged double standards. To um, analyze what is at stake in the contestation, I conceptualized the nuclear non-proliferation regime as an unstable modus vivendi um, between two diametrically opposed normative attitudes regarding nuclear weapons, that is, between pro- and anti-nuclear weapon attitudes. Uh, the modus vivendi is incapable of resolving the fundamental normative conflict between the two, and the discontent with the compromise often takes the form of a contestation over double standards. I also point out that the defenders of the regime uh, often employ uh, two um, contrasting rhetorical strategies to naturalize the hierarchy. One is what I call the strategy of necessity, which presents the acceptance of the uh, nuclear fate accompli at the time of the treaty negotiation as unfortunate but necessary. The other is the strategy of uh, distributive justification, which um, differentiates uh, the so-called uh, responsible states from irresponsible ones based on alleged civilizational qualities and thus uh, justify the hierarchy outright. These two um, different strategies are often used in tandem to head off accusations of double standards. The problem of justice in the global nuclear order uh, has received a lot of attention in recent years 
thanks to the 2017 Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty. I hope my chapter will give you some insight into this critical program. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Ruins Chikuma. I'm a professor at uh, the University of Alberta in Canada. And uh, my chapter, the title of my chapter is Hiroshima in France, Forgetting Hiroshima to Accept French Ultramodernity and its Nuclear Policies. So it, mm, the thesis of my chapter is contained in my title. In order to accept nuclear policies in France and what goes with them, with these policies, which is mainly French ultramodernity and the nuclear policies themselves, it is better to try to ignore anything that reminds French people of nuclear problems, such as Hiroshima. So my chapter is divided in three parts. The first one is forgetting Hiroshima, the second one is why, and the third one the conclusion. The first one, forgetting Hiroshima, is made of two parts, which is first stating the facts that very few fictions or non-fictions uh, are present in French collective memory. You do have some exceptions, but they are only in the elite collective memory, not in the popular collective memory. So it means that very few people know about that. Uh, it's surprising that Hiroshima is not uh, present because Japan and Japanese culture is very present in France uh, in many forms since uh, Japanism in, in about uh, 1860s, right? In different formats, different forms, different media, but it's very present, but not Hiroshima. So why? And this is the thesis, right? That to accept French nuclear policies and French ultramodernity, uh, you had three ways of explaining. The first one is the centrality of Auschwitz within the centrality of the European project. The second one is the, central, uh, the centrality of nuclear policies, uh, civil and military. And the third one is self-censorship. Uh, this is based on uh, the study of an anthropologist who uh, study uh, in a small town next to a nuclear plant and concluded that these French people living around the nuclear plant didn't want to talk about the nuclear plant because they knew that it was not really safe. At the same time, they knew that they needed the, the nuclear plant for, for example, their job. So the conclusion is very much that Hiroshima was and still is not very present in uh, French collective memory. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jordan Vincent. I'm the author of the uh, last chapter in this book on Ukraine's uh, nuclear disarmament. Um, so what I did with that chapter, what I aimed to do, was I provided an overview of uh, Ukraine's disarmament process, and then I tried to give a summary of a few of the authors that I looked at and the main authors that discussed the issue. So in terms of the overview portion, um, I just wanted to give a high level kind of background to it for people to understand some of the arguments of the ensuing, or of the authors within the ensuing uh, historiography uh, section. Um, I find that Ukraine is an interesting case study for disarmament. It's one of the few in the world that have done it, so along with a few other former Soviet states like Belarus and Kazakhstan. Um, they mainly just shipped their weapons to uh, Russia uh, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Ukraine uh, did not do that. It negotiated its um, disarmament process with first Russia and that didn't really produce any results. Then that went on with the United States and over time, within two or three years, we get the 1994 agreements and uh, we'll see that in the chapter. But Ukraine's an interesting case study because prior to uh, its invasion from Russia in uh, 2014, you could view that its disarmament process was a, largely a success. It got economic benefits and security assurances. However, those assurances were somewhat of a double-edged sword. Following 2014, uh, those assurances, which were glaringly uh, apparent, uh, not guarantees, uh, didn't really help Ukraine much, and it lost territory to a Russian invasion and Russian-backed separatists. So, in a broader sense, it's Ukraine's an interesting case for both scholars and then kind of trying to analyze the policy implications uh, in international relations going forward. Uh, and finally, I think Ukraine's an interesting case because 
I grant, I know that uh, nuclear issues, nuclear disarmament is somewhat of a niche issue, but Ukraine hasn't, and particularly Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan have all not received that much attention in describing what's happened and trying to place in the grander picture of uh, disarmament and security issues. It received a bit of attention in the 1990s and a little in 2014 around the invasion, but not much since. So I hope you take a crack at the chapter and that you enjoy it and that you enjoy the other chapters in the book as well. Thank you. Bye. Hello everyone, I'm David Markles and I'm the co-editor of the book uh, Hiroshima 75. My area of expertise is Russia and Eastern Europe, but I'd like to just say a few words about the atom generally by way of a conclusion. Uh, in the book we've tried to present several aspects of atomic power, atomic energy and atomic weapons its use in culture and arts, its place in politics today. And 75 years ago, the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan. And the impact of that bomb is still taking place even now. But 75 years on, there's never been any usage of the atomic bomb in international wars anywhere in the world. But several countries now are the owners or possessors of bombs, some of them in fairly precarious areas of the world. I'll mention one or two. Uh, India and Pakistan have been in a virtual state of war for the past 70 years. Both are atomic weapon powers. Russia remains a major atomic weapons power, as does the United States, Britain, France, China, and others. But perhaps the main danger of atomic weapons today is the use by terrorists in warlike situations. For example, we see groups like ISIS uh, taking part in operations throughout the world. There are other groups that may eventually find themselves in possession of an atomic weapon. And this, I think, is one of the biggest concerns today, is what to do about proliferation and to make sure that these bombs don't ever find their way into the hands of the terrorists. We've also looked at nuclear power. Um, myself, I examined the Chernobyl disaster, which took place uh, in 1986, 34 years ago. And in Japan as well, in 2011, there was the accident at Fukushima, nuclear power station caused by a tsunami and followed by flooding of the nuclear power plant and it being put out of operation. Nuclear power remains a major energy source around the world. The question is, will it last forever? Can it be replaced by more benign sources? Or will we need to use nuclear power to phase out harmful environmental products like coal and oil? We've seen the use also of the atom in nuclear medicine and there I think it is a better use of of the atom so it does have a positive effect as well. We hope with this book that we if we've not resolved questions we've at least attracted interest in various aspects of the atom today 75 years after it was first used and with that I will close this little um, interchange.